So welcome to the third presentation on CROC 1 2016 booklet, CROC 1 2016 booklet. So a patient has been hospitalized with a provisional diagnosis of virus B hepatitis. In other words, hepatitis B. But before I continue, how do you check or which marker do you look at for when you have a problem with the liver or when there's a, uh, a, an infection in the liver? Who can tell me? Which biomarkers are you looking at for? ALT and AST. Exactly. ALT, ALT and AST. Exactoma. Exactoma. But of course, the other thing that you can look at for. But then for now, we know all of these things are in our head, which is very good. Now, they are saying that serological reaction based on complementation of antigen with antibody chemically bound to perioxidase or alkaline phosphatase was used for this disease diagnosis or for the disease diagnosis. What is the name of the applied serological reaction? What is the name of the applied serological reaction? And of course, many of you uh, might have heard of, uh, of this before, but basically we are dealing with what? Antigen, antibody reactions, antigen, antibody reaction that means specific uh antibody to a specific what antigen because you're looking for what uh, uh, don't forget if you want to do the antigens what hbs that is uh have the b surface what antigen isn't it that means it's very what specific isn't it very, very specific so this kind of surgical character that we use to identify the specific uh antigen or antibody we we'll call it what we we'll call it uh, an immune assay. Sorry, an immune enzyme analysis, an immune enzyme analysis, and this is used to detect the presence of either a specific antigen or a specific antibody in the patient's blood sample. Specific antigen or a specific what antibody? So talking about antibody, we're talking about what HBS AG. That is. Uh, hepatitis B surface antigen. Hepatitis B surface antigen. And of course, we use uh, perioxidases or alkaline phosphatase or glucose oxidase. These are the, uh, uh, the chemicals that we use to help in the analysis. I repeat, glucose oxidase, alkaline phosphatase, and perioxidase. These ones we can use to identify our specific antigen or antibody. But the whole test is called the immune enzyme analysis. So the answer here is C. A patient with insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, insulin-dependent, has been administered with what? Insulin. He has been given what? Insulin. After a certain period of time, the patient developed fatigue, irritability, excessive sweating. What is the main mechanism of such presentation, of such presentations developing, of such presentations uh, developing? So, now when I say something is what? Insulin dependent. It means glucose depends on the insulin, isn't it? So that means the more insulin you give, the less glucose you will see. Aha. Uh -huh. It is insulin dependent diabetes. That means in the absence of insulin, glucose will be high and hence diabetes. So this person was given what? Insulin. Then what happens if you give too much insulin? Who can tell me? What happens when you give too much insulin? What happens? Oh, nobody. If the patient runs into low blood sugar. Good. Yeah. So the person runs into what? Low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. When you give what? Too much of what? The insulin. And that can lead to this presentation. So now the question now is that what is the main mechanism of this presentation? And don't forget, don't forget, that carbohydrates also means what glucose, because the, the, the smaller unit of the carbohydrate is the glucose. Aha, uh -huh. is the glucose. And that is why over here, based on what we are having over here, we can say the person is having what? Starvation of glucose. 
starvation of glucose or carbohydrate starvation of the brain. Carbohydrate starvation of the brain. What it means is that hypoglycemia has developed or low glucose in the blood. And when there's low glucose in the blood, the brain will be affected because the brain loves uh, glucose a lot. It loves glucose. It loves glucose a lot. So over here, we can say we're having a case of what? Low glucose or carbohydrate starvation. All right. Examination of a 52-year-old woman revealed a decrease in the amount of red blood cells and an increase in free hemoglobin in the blood. Color index is 0 0.85. What type of anemia has developed? First of all, there is decreased amount of what? RBCs. Decreased amount of what? RBCs. And now there are what? Free hemoglobin. Free hemoglobin. Now, at what condition can we have free hemoglobin? What would happen to the red blood cells? Uh, probably, like, the red blood cells would die. Yes. Good. So when red, uh, red blood cells are dying or when they are uh, uh, destroyed, there will be a lot of what? Free hemoglobin what, coming out. Because these hemoglobin are actually needed in the blood to bind with iron so they can carry what? Oxygen. So now when we are having free hemoglobin, that means that the red blood cells are what? Are broken down. Red blood cells are broken down, are broken down, are broken down, are broken down. So the question is that what is the mechanism so what, what type of anemia has developed in this case? Obviously, we are having what? A hemolysis or hemolytic kind of anemia. But this person is what? 52 years old. 52 years old. 52 years old. And we cannot... But we are giving more, more information if it was to be what? Hereditary type of what? Hemolysis. That means... As they born the picking, uh, the person has started, uh, started uh, how do you call it? Uh, the rebels started breaking. But this is not hereditary. This is rather what? An acquired hemolytic John, uh, anemia. Acquired hemolytic uh, anemia. Acquired hemolytic anemia. Anemia, anemia, anemia. Why? Because it is a late onset late onset at early onset we will be thinking of what hereditary hereditary all right now now in hemorrhagic of course they would give you a history that would denote that this person was bleeding for a very very long time but there's no such thing in this question so we can obviously say we are having a, a hemorrhagic kind of what uh anemia and that's what over here we are looking at for what for b to be our answer. Yes, you can argue that there could be what? Anemia due to decreased erythropoiesis. Of course, when you have a decreased uh, erythropoiesis, what it means is that there will be decreased amount of red blood cells. No, no doubt about that. There will be decreased concentration of red blood cells. However, there wouldn't be what? Free hemoglobin present. Uh -huh. That's why we didn't go in for what? Erythropoiesis. But rather, this. I mean, by rather uh, acquired hemolytic. So the answer is B. Poisoning caused by mercury uh, chloride occurred in the occurred in the result of safety rules violation. Okay, two days. The patient's dinner duration is six hundred and twenty mils. The patient developed headache, vomiting, convulsion, dyspnea, cracks in the lungs. Name this pathology. Name this pathology. Name this pathology. And over here, definitely, we are having a hypoperfusion of the kidney. We are having hypoperfusion of the kidney because the daily duresis is quite what? Low. Daily, daily duresis is quite what? Low. And that is why, and of course, with a history of mercury, which also has high affinity for destroying the, the kidney. So over here, we could be looking at what? A renal failure. We could be looking at a renal failure or acute renal failure, acute renal 
failure or acute kidney injury injury acute kidney injury why one the poisoning two the diuresis is quite low although we are having what uh, and again if diuresis is quite low don't forget that means that waste substances will not be excreted isn't it because the kidney is damaged and when waste substances are not excreted what happens the brain get what affected with the poisonous substances that are produced by the liver and for the kidney to get rid of like ammonia all of them get accumulated in the blood and these can affect the brain for it to cause what the convulsion and things like that aha uh-huh. and that's what over here we are looking at what at acute renal failure acute renal failure so your answer is e I love this question is because anything about concentration of sodium and things like that you could know it. For people adapted to high external temperatures, high external temperatures, profuse sweating is not accompanied by loss of large volumes of sodium chloride. This is caused by the effect of the following hormone which has on the respiratory glands. What it means is that what will prevent the excretion of sodium chloride what will prevent the excretion of sodium chloride in other words what will retain sodium chloride in the blood who can tell me what retains sodium is it aldosterone don't say is it it is aldosterone okay. always be sure of your answer because looking at the option you're having over here of course uh not uh not diuretic as we explain it to excrete sodium out of the uh, out of the body vasopressin deals with water aha uh-huh. vasopressin deals with water so of course you are dealing with what aldosterone because aldosterone helps in the concentration of what of sodium in the blood or reabsorption of sodium in the blood so it prevent its excretion and they are saying that sweating with a uh, not accompanied not accompanied by loss of large volumes that means too much of sodium doesn't get out of the body and that's why your answer is aldosterone the process of heat transfer in a naked person naked person at room temperature has been studied it was revealed that under these conditions the greatest amount of heat is transferred by and of course you are thinking of what radiation heat radiation from a naked person that means you are naked that is why sometimes when you um aha uh-huh, all of you are in ukraine when you go and bath in the in the hot kind of water i mean under the shower some of you can put the heater i don't know if you want to burn yourself or something but then you come out the heat will be evaporating from your body isn't it that mechanism is what to call what heat radiation that mechanism is called what heat radiation in other words this is the transfer of internal energy in the form of electromagnetic what waves it is the transfer of internal energy internal energy so it's coming out from your system going out and always the key whether you would know that this is heat radiation is that they will say naked body or light clothed light clothed light clothed light clothed these are the things that helps you to know that yes they are referring to what heat radiation heat radiation so your answer here is what is a the internal body outside all right again this question is a bonus one Now due to disruption of the certain structures of the brain stem an animal has lost its orientative reflexes response first of all who can tell me what these orientative reflexes are orientative reflexes who can tell me what they are anyone quadrigeminal body quadrigeminal bodies exactly so what are the types of quadrigeminal body that, uh, that you know anterior and posterior anterior and posterior or superior and, and inferior. inferior good so what controls 
hearing what controls vision. Superior vision, inferior yeah. hearing. Come again. Superior is for vision and Good. inferior is for hearing. Superior is for vision and what? And the inferior one is, is for hearing. Good. So now inferior is the same as posterior. Whilst superior is the same as anterior. Take note. So these are the words superior or what? Superior or anterior. And this is what? Inferior or posterior. Good. So over here, there's a note. Uh, now, in response to light stimuli, light. What this is light a hearing mechanism or a vision mechanism? Vision. Oh, it's what vision, and so therefore your answer is what anterior, anterior or superior. Anterior. Thank you, thank you. Now, if I, you guys have understood this question, so it's easy. Always analyze the question. Always analyze it. All right. Urine analysis has shown high levels of proteins, protein and erythrocyte in the urine. High levels of protein and erythrocyte in the urine. This can be caused by the following. So first of all, are we supposed to see proteins and red blood cells in the urine? Yes or no? No. 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 So if you start seeing it, what does it mean? A renal failure or glomerulonephritis. Yes, but what happens to the permeability? It increases. Increase. Yeah, there's an increase. That means there's the, the holes have opened up, isn't it? It has opened up, so things are just getting they, just they enter anyhow. Just they enter. It's just like when you are sieving something. And all of a sudden, the holes are now big. Even the big particles start entering into the, <laughs> passing to the sieve, isn't it? That is what we are having in this question. So over here, there is what? A problem with what? Renal filter permeability. Permeability, not the pressure. Permeability. Permeability. So over here, your answer is what? It's A. Permeability. Permeability. All right. Along with the normal hemoglobin types, there can be pathological ones in the organism of an adult. Name one of them. Name first of all, who can tell me any abnormal hemoglobin in? I mean, adults or anybody who can tell me? We say it a lot. Eh? Yes. Oh, um, sickle Good sickle, sickle cell. Sickle Great. Cell. Great. Sickle cell, sickle cell. And over here, that is the only thing that you can be thinking about. But of course, you can think of other, other things, but that might not be necessarily be what? The hemoglobin. It might be the globulins. Okay. And now we call them what? Thalassemias. If you guys have heard about it before in your uh, pharmacology, I mean, in your part physio uh, lectures. Thalassemias. Those are the globins. Globins. But over here, we're looking at what? Uh, hemoglobin what? S or sickle cell. Hemoglobin S or sickle cell. This means fetal hemoglobin. And it's normal because fetal hemoglobin is normal. So please don't take... Uh, do take note of some of uh, these things. These can be found in adults. These can be found in adults. But A1 is more than the A2. A1 is more than the A2. A1 is more than the A2. So just take note of some of these things. And of course, hemoglobin binds to oxygen as well. All right. Development of both immune, immune and allergic reactions is based upon the following, is based upon the same mechanisms of immune response to an antigen. What is the diff, main difference between immune and allergic reaction? What is the what? The main difference between immune and allergic reaction. What is the difference? What is the difference? Yes, they are saying both immune and allergic reaction is based upon what? The same mechanism of the immune system response to an antigen. But why do we have what to call 
hypersensitivity reaction. Who can tell me? Why do we say something is hypersensitivity? Which is more or less like allergic reaction. Why do we say hypersensitivity? Oh, hypersensitivity. No one? Hyper. Come again. Is it a reaction or abnormal reaction to an antigen? Good. So, yes, like look at us, you guys are already saying. So, we are having what? For example, we know you have to react to something, okay? But sometimes when somebody do something to you, they say, oh, oh, you have react, you have overreacted. Haven't you heard something like that before? Oh, you are overreacting. Yes. So let me first you can to react is normal, but to overreact. Now we have to say you are overreacting. So stop that. So or relax, calm down. You are overreacting. What it means to overreact is that your immune system is res responding uh, aggressively to that antigen. And that aggressive response to that antigen always lead to what? Tissue damage. So any reaction that is leading to tissue damage is an allergic or hypersensitivity reaction. I repeat, any uh, reaction that is leading to tissue damage, we call it what? Hypersensitivity reaction. Just like when a Fortuna gets angry, when a person gets angry, now she will pick even their phone and hit it on the ground. Three of us. I know you will say first. Please, this phone is expensive. Or no? <laughs> no, but I hope you guys get what I'm trying to say. So when you overreact, some people will hit something on the television and to destroy it. All of these things are called what? Because it's leading to what? A damage of something. And because something is damaged, we call it what? Hypersensitivity reaction. So over here, what is the main difference between your immune responding to an allergic reaction is that there is what? The development of tissue lesion. That's all. That's the difference. Development of what? Tissue uh, lesion. Now, I hope you do know that every single day, your body is fighting against diseases. Do you know that, guys? Every single time. Your immune system is always working. But it is not causing any damage to your tissue because perhaps your vitamins are good or you have the right amount of vitamins in your system. You have the right amount of this or that or that or that or that. So your immune system is strong. So it's warding off against you. That's why you don't go... Some of you, they are asking now, when was the last time you went, to, uh, you went to the hospital? Some of you tell me that, to be honest, you don't remember. One year ago, two years ago. Some people too... Yesterday I went. Maybe last week I even went. Something like that. Uh -huh. That means that your immune is working, for, is working for you. So you have to take care of your body very well. Eat the right kind of food, the right balanced diet. Don't go and be eating Emmanuel's kind of food, everyday manka. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay? Don't let Tolu prepare you a nice meal with the egusi and then with the obono uh, soup and things like that. Please, eat those kind of food. Histologic preparation stained with arson. Arson demonstrates from 40 to 60 fenestrated elastic membranes within the middle coat of the vessel. The middle coat of the vessel. Name this vessel. Guys, do you remember when I was talking about the different types of veins and arteries or how to classify a vein and an artery? Simply put, vessels. So we talk about the intima. We talk about uh, the middle layer. Then we talk about the uh, outer layer. Then we say one of the key areas that you have to look out for is what? The middle layer. What is it made up of? Made up of? Is it made up of more of muscles and less of elastic? Or is it made of more of elastic and less of muscles? So you, you, you describe it. Then you come to the outer layer. Is it made uh, more of connective tissue or more of, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, adventitious tissues. You have to look at all of these things to be able to classify uh, the types of what? Uh, artery or generally the type of uh, uh, 
vessel you are having. Now, over here, they are saying that there's what? A lot of what? Elastic membranes. A lot of elastic membranes. So what kind of vessel are you looking at for? What kind of vessels are you looking at for? Definitely, you are looking at what? An elastic, elastic what? Artery. You are looking at elastic artery, elastic artery, elastic artery. So your answer is what is D, elastic artery. Now in mix, that means there is both elastic and what muscular, maybe. Aha. Uh -huh. So don't get confused. Angiocardiography of a sixty-year-old man revealed constriction of a vessel located in the left coronary sulcus of the heart. Name this pathological uh, vessel. Name this pathological vessel. And I think uh, uh, Faustina has done us a great job by posting something like that on the group page because we have done it before. And I, I saw her posting it. I saw her posting it. So the question now is that what vessel passes through the left coronary sulcus? And if you can remember very well, we are saying this what the Ramos what circumflex circumflex the Ramos circumflex 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 of course this thing you need diagram to ascertain what I'm talking about but this is what the Ramos circumflex the Ramos circumflex or circumflex coronary artery circumflex coronary artery and this is a branch of the left artery the left anterior descending artery the left anterior descending artery and it passes through the left coronary sulcus, the left coronary sulcus. So please try and be on the telegram page and look at the diagram. It is there. All right, so the answer is B. A comatose patient was taken to the hospital. He has a history of diabetes mellitus. Okay, Kushma breathing, low blood pressure, acetone odor of uh, of breath after emergency treatment the patient's condition improved guys before i continue what kind of acid base disorder will happen what kind of acid base reaction yes acidosis acidosis, acidosis. So acidosis, is it excretory? Is it metabolic, respiratory? What kind of acidosis is it? Metabolic. Metabolic, thank you. I know it's not part of the question, but it's a revision, okay? So acetone bodies end up producing what? A lot of what? Uh, ions. And that can increase the acidity of the blood. So this one can develop what? Uh, uh, metabolic uh, acidosis. Okay, for those who are just joining us, we have talked about some of these things. And they can all be found on the website. So please do all to get in touch with the website and enjoy what we have over there. Now, what drug? Now, the question is that, okay, the question has, has improved. So now, what drug was given? What drug was given? So now you have what? Diabetes mellitus. You have, that means too much of what? Glucose. So what do you give? What do you give? Glucose. What do you give? Quick. Insulin. Insulin, because you need a short acting drug, isn't it? Because an emergency case, an emergency case, so you need a short acting, short acting, short acting. And that's over here, you can give what? You can give insulin, but for long term, you can give what? The glabenclamide for the long term management or for them to take home, you can give them the glabenclamide. But for emergency, quick, quick, insulin will be given as simple as ABCD. All right. A patient complains of pain in the right lateral abdomen. If I were you, I will start locating my lateral abdomen. I will start locating my lateral abdomen. Uh huh. Right lateral abdomen. Yes. From your liver area going down, all of them are your lateral abdomen. Now, palpation revealed a dense, immobile tumor like formation. The tumor is likely to be found in the following part of the digestive system. So, guys, which part of the colon is found? On that side of your abdomen, who can tell me? Ascending colon. Ascending, Ascending colon is like this. This is how it is. Okay. Now over here, you can be thinking about your 
your your cecum and then your the appendix over here between some those things. But over here, which is your lateral, more of your lateral side, right lateral side, this is the what the ascending colon. Then this is the transverse colon. Then that is the descending colon. Then that is the sigmoid. Then we have the rectum and then co and then whatever. All right. So the ascending colon, 100% correct. A patient hospitalized due to mercury intoxication. Mercury intoxication. Guys, you remember we just did a question on mercury, right? We said it can affect what the kidney can cause it of what problems, isn't it? Good. So now look. A patient hospitalized due to mercury intoxication presents with the following processes in the kidney: focal necrotic changes of the tubules of the major renal regions. There's edema, leukocyte infiltration, hemorrhages in the interstitial tissue, venous congestion. What condition developed in this patient? And even without going through your answers, already you know that mercury intoxication can destroy the kidney. So we can have what? Those who don't have chronic, we have what? An acute, because intoxication happens suddenly, isn't it? I mean, this kind of mercury intoxication to the, to the kidney, it happens what? Suddenly. Okay, so that one we have what the acute condition, acute condition, not chronic. So already we know you should be having what an acute renal failure or aki that is acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury. But over here they want to now they've gone further, so they tell us the exact part of the kidney which is affected, the exact part of the kidney which is affected. And over here we are looking at what. Focal necrotic changes in the tubules, tubules of the major renal region. So, talking about the tubules, the tubules, the tubules, the tubules, and that's over here. Your diagnosis will be what acute tubular necrosis, acute tubular necrosis, because the tubes are undergoing what necrosis, and this is an, an acute condition, and hence acute tubular necrosis. And that another term for acute tubular necrosis is necronephrosis or acute necrotic nephrosis. Acute necronephrosis. Necro or necronephrosis. Necronephrosis or acute necrotic nephrosis is the same thing. Or acute tubular necrosis. So over here, your answer should be what? Should be C. All right. Now, according to phenotypic diagnosis of a female patient, of a female patient has been provisionally diagnosed with X chromosome polysomia. X chromosome polysomia. Pro polysomia. X chromosome, that's what I mean by polysomia. Now, this diagnosis can be confirmed by cytogenic method. What karyotype? Of course, we are going to have what? XXX or trisomy X is the same as X chromosome polysomia. Chromosome polysomia. So over here, we are looking at what trisomy X, which is 47 triple X, 47 triple X, 47 triple X. All right. I'm here to see X, X, Y, Y. And I'm here to see X, 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 Y. All right. So here your answer is what? Trisomy X, which is what? B. An unconscious young man in the state of morphine intoxication. Morphine intoxication. Before I continue, what drug can be used as an antidote for morphine intoxication? Who can tell me? Naloxone. Naloxone. Thank you, guys. Has been delivered. Okay, are you guys not sure that you, can, you guys are already practicing medicine? Because the way you put it, give me the answers, I do feel. <laughs> Anyways, it's good. It's good. I'm, 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 I'm happy. An unconscious young man in the state of morphine intoxication has been delivered into an admission room. The patient's respiration is slow and shallow due to suppression 
of the respiratory center. Who can tell me which, where we can find the respiratory centers? Where? Medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata. Correct for three points. Exactly. Medulla oblongata. That is where everything is located, isn't it? Respiration, even digestion, they all can be found over there. What kind of respiratory failure has occurred in this case? So, guys, look at it. There is what? Now, note the difference between restriction, obstruction, and then dysregulation. Note the difference. Now, in restriction, what it means is that you are breathing in, but something is what? Uh, your, 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 how do I have to put yourself? Your, your lungs is not able to require to accommodate air. So, air is what? Restricted. That is what? Respiratory restriction. When we talk about obstruction, example is asthma. You are trying to breathe out, but something is blocking air from coming out or air from even entering. That's what obstructs. Something is obstructing it. Something is what? Obstructing it. Then we'll talk about what? Dysregulation. Dysregulation comes from the center. Center of what? That means there's nothing with asthma. There's nothing with the lungs being uh, 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 undergoing scarring. Or, there's nothing wrong with the heart. Sorry, with the lungs. Nothing wrong with the bronchioles or the airway. But the problem is coming from where? From the respiratory center. In other words, from the medulla oblongata. Aha. Uh -huh. So in that case, over here, what kind of respiratory failure are we looking at for? We are looking at what? Dysregulation. We are looking at dysregulation. Dysregulation. So your answer is A. On historical examination of uterine mucosa, the following is detected. Uterine mucosa. Okay. Seno Sorry. Senos glands. There were senos glands, serratiform and corkscrew-shaped elongated growth of stroma with cell proliferation. With cell proliferation. When we say something is proliferate, uh, proliferating, what do we mean? We are meaning that it is what? Overgrowing, isn't it? Also known as hyperplasia. Also known as hyperplasia. Hyperplasia. Or they are what? Proliferating too much. So we're having what? Corkscrew elongated growth. So we are having what? Too much of what growth? Of the uterine mucosa, the glands, the glands, the sinus glands. They are over proliferating. And the term for it is called what? Or what diagnosis can we make of this? We can say we are having what? A glandular endometrial hyperplasia. Glandular endometrial hyperplasia. Where the inner lining of the uterus is overgrowing. The inner lining of the uterus is overgrowing. And so therefore, your answer will be C. 10 minutes after the beginning of heavy physical work, a person demonstrates increased of erythrocyte number from 4 to 4.5. What is the cause of this phenomenon? What is the cause of this phenomenon? So you have done exercise and now blood cells are now increasing. So what is the mechanism of action. So first of all, during physical exercise or work, you and I know that acute hypoxia is developed. When we say hypoxia, we mean insufficient oxygen develops. And that's the more reason why they have lactate in their, in their body or paint in their due to lactic acid because there's decreased amount of what? Oxygen there is decreased amount of what, oxygen. Now, 
because there's decreased amount of oxygen, what the brain or what the body does as a way of compensation is that it causes more red blood cells to flow out or to come out so that the little amount of oxygen that is there, these erythrocytes will pick them up. Don't forget, in every erythrocyte, we have the hemoglobin, isn't it? Which will bind with what? With oxygen. Aha. Uh-huh. So what it means is that even though there's inadequate oxygen, but what it means is that when we have more substances to, uh, to pick up the oxygen, what it means is that it can serve as a compensation what? mechanism for the patient. It serves as a what? Compensation what? Mechanism. Uh-huh. And that is called what? Uh, compensatory what? Mechanism. Compensatory mechanism. And so therefore, the red blood cells remove from where they are and then they come into what? Into systemic uh, or central circulation. They will come into what? The central circulation. And that's what over here, we are dealing with what? With erythrocyte what? Exit from the depot. Erythrocyte what? Exit from the depot. Now, in cases whereby red blood cells are being destroyed. Don't forget, these ones are not destroyed, though. The red blood cells are not being destroyed. They are there, but they are not enough to meet the needs of the body. Uh-huh. Good. So, more will be forced to come out. But when we come to uh, erythropoiosis, whereby, you know, red blood cells begin to be manufactured more, it's when we can't even find them in the uh, peripheral what, blood stream or in the, uh, in the blood. So they are decreased either by hemolysis or by any kind of anemia or things like that. So red blood cells begin to, to produce more so that it can compensate for it. Uh-huh. So that is in that light. So that's what compensation is caused by this one. But over here, we are not dealing with what loss of RBC, uh, RBCs. We are dealing with what increased number of what RBCs already existing one. Good. So over here we have what we have the A as our answer. All right. Why have my screen gone dark? Guys, is my screen dark in your eyes? No. Ah, uh, okay. All right, all right, all right. A patient has a traumatic injury of the stenocleidomastoid muscle. If I were you, I'll just turn my, my, my neck to the, to the left or to the right and sense my stenocleidomastoid muscle. Just sense it. It's very, very nicely positioned. Uh-huh. Just sense it. Just, just, just have a feel of it. Now, there's an injury to this muscle. This has resulted in a decrease of the following volume. In the decrease of the following volume. Now, you know that when it comes to respiration, okay, apart from the internal and then the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm being involved in uh, respiration, one thing you must know that you must know is that the the sternocleidomastoid muscle also is involved in what? In respiration. It's involved in respiration. But to be specific, it is involved in inspiration. That means taking in of what? Air. It is involved in inspiration. Inspiration. That is inhaling air. So that's what the sternocleidomastoid muscle does. So in the case where we're having what? Injury to this muscle. What does it mean? What it means is that inspiration will be what? Reduce. And that is why we said over here, inspiratory reserve volume will uh, decrease. Inspiratory reserve volume will be decreased. Inspiratory reserve volume uh, will be decreased. Good. So what then is inspiratory reserve volume? Inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of extra air that is inhaled 
during a deep breath. During a deep breath. So when I, when I want to ask you, just take a deep breath. Ah, I don't say exhale, but I fully exhale. But just take a deep breath. So the muscle that is involved is the what? The stenocleidomastoid what? Muscle. Uh-huh. Good, 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 good. So now, you answer is what? Is D. Is D. All right. Autopsy of a 40-year-old woman who died of cerebral hemorrhage during hypertensive crisis revealed the following. Upper body obesity, hypertrichosis, hysotism, stretch marks on the skin of the thigh and the abdomen, pituitary basophil adenoma on the anterior lobe. The diagnosis is called what? So we would have told you what? There is a problem with the pituitary, isn't it? There is a problem with the pituitary. Now, who can tell me the difference between a Cushing disease and a Cushing syndrome? I know I've said it before. Uh, Anyone? You yeah. said with the Cushing disease, there mm -hmm. is maybe a tumor with the um, anterior lobe of the pituitary, but then with the Cushing syndrome, it's a problem with the adrenal cortex. Good, 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 good. But to make it clear, when we say a syndrome, we are referring to what? Any sign and symptom of too much cortisol. Aha. Uh -huh. Now you see, irrespective of the cause, you know a lot of things can cause too much cortisol to be, I mean, to be high. I mean, for it to be too much cortisol level. So anytime you have what? Any signs and symptoms of high cholesterol or hyper uh, uh, too much cholesterol, we have what the Cushing syndrome. Now, in Cushing disease, yes, we are having hyper cholesterol level, but the causative agent is always the big guy, which sits on the, on some chair called the cella tussica. Uh huh. Good. So over here, you are looking at what at a Cushing disease. Cushing disease. In some books, they will add the Cushing syndrome. That's why I want you guys to get the difference between the two. Get the difference between the two. All right. A specimen shows an organ that is covered with a, a, covered with a connective tissue capsule with radiating trabeculae. There are also cortex containing lymph nodes and a modulary Court made of lymphoid cells, made of lymphoid cells. What organ is under study? What organ is under study? Of course, you need to know which organ you're talking about, isn't it? But over here, you are dealing more of what with a lymphoid what node, lymphoid node, lymphoid node, and lymphoid node is surrounded by a fibrous capsule, uh, which extends inside the lymph node to form. A trabeculae. Uh -huh. So the capsule, assuming, I'm not good with drawing, but assuming this is a, a lymph node, okay? Over it, we have the capsule covering it. But the capsule can also what, go inside, okay? And be coming around. Then go inside like this, then be coming around. So these are what? Trabeculae. These are our trabeculae. And these trabeculae are coming from what the capsule. Okay? They are all part of the capsule. They invigilate into the what? Into the tissue or whatever you want to call it. Aha. Uh -huh. So, yeah. And of course, with every, this one, it also has the cortex and what? The medulla. So take note of some of these things. But basically, we are dealing with the lymphoid what? Node. We are dealing with the lymphoid node, the lymphoid node. And of course, the lymphoid node is or are the major site of B and T cells, B and T lymphocyte, B and T lymphocyte, B and T lymphocyte. Take note of that. All right. But of course, maturation. So get a difference. So maturation will be what from the thymus. All right. 
after a craniocerebral injury, a patient has lost the ability to recognize shapes of objects by touch. Uh, I think I've well, we've been before. We talk about the what the the, the pre-central gyros, the post-central gyros, and all the, what they each and every one of them do. I think we have spoken about them before. But what area of the cerebral cortex normally contains the relevant center? So this this is what touch. This is what touch, touch, touch. Uh -huh. Just like when somebody is touching somebody. All of you know what I'm talking about, but I won't mention it. Shame on you. Aha. Uh -huh. So when somebody is touching somebody, that part is what we are referring to right now. That part is what we are referring to right now. And we are referring to what? Uh, we're referring to the superior parental what lobo, the superior parent uh, uh, parietal what lobo, superior, the superior parietal lobo, and this is bound in front by the upper part of the post central sulcus. It is bound by the what the post central what sulcus. But it's always also what connected with the post central what gyros above the end of the sulcus. Sometimes this thing I wish we had a diagram to uh, show you how each and every one of them is. But mainly what they're talking about is the Broadman's area. We call something Broadman's area. Broadman's area. Broadman's area. And we talk about area five and area seven. Area five and area seven. I wish someone could get me a diagram for that. Area five and area seven. Of course, you know, Faustina, don't let me talk too much. We have what? Area five and the area seven. These control those sense of what? Of, 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 of touch or to recognize the shape of objects by touch. By touch. And if you realize people who are blind, who can really see, this part of their brain is very, very sensitive. Have you seen any blind man who can tell exactly what he or she is holding? Or can tell if you pass by? No, this is a rabbina. I know you for sure. The scent alone, even your scent, they can, they can know it. Your scent, they can know it. So please take note of some of these things. Alright, so over here, we're having what? The superior parental what? Uh, parietal what lobo. If I were you, I will go and look for the supramagena, the angular, and in the post central gyro. The function of each and every one of them. Some of them deals with learning. Some of them deals with different things. Please, that is how to learn. Do well and go through some of details. And I think we have discussed a lot of them already. We've talked about them already. So please watch the videos for me. Monoamide oxidase inhibitors are widely used as psychopharmacological uh, drugs. They change the level of nearly all neurotransmitters in synapses. Which of the following neurotransmitters is what exempted? Guys, we discussed this again. We have discussed this. One. We are saying that these monoamide oxidases basically are dealing with what? They are dealing with the epinephrines, the not, in other words, catecholamines or catecholamines, isn't it? And catecholamines contain the serotonins, the no adrenaline, the adrenalines, the dopamines, except for acetylcholine. Except for acetylcholine. Uh -huh. So please take note of that. Except acetylcholine. So over here, we're looking at what? At E as our answer, acetylcholine. The rest... They are controlled by this monoamide oxidases. So their inhibition will inhibit them, but it will never inhibit what? Acetylcholine. A worker of an agricultural enterprise had been suffering from an acute disease with aggravating intoxication signs, which resulted in his death. Autopsy shows the spleen is enlarged, flaccid, dark, cherry red in the session, yield excessive pop script. Soft meninges of the phonics in the base of the brain are edematous and saturated with blood. Saturated with blood. 
microscopically, we have serous hemorrhagic inflammation of meninges and the cerebral tissue. Make the diagnosis. Guys, the clue here is this person has been working as an agricultural what? enterprise. Agricultural enterprise. So the question now is that what organism or what sort of infection can cause this type of a thing? Or what microorganism can cause this type of infection? And your answer is what? It's what? Anthrax. 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 Exactly. Exactly. We've done these things. Anthrax. 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 So the condition is called what? They can call it to call anthrax meningitis. Anthrax meningitis. And again, they are characterized by dark cherry red appearance or that cherry red spleen when you cut it there could be edema of the meninges and things like that so over here we're looking at at anthrax 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 a patient has been delivered into a surgical ward with an incised wound of the anterior surface an incised wound on the anterior surface of the shoulder in its lower one third, lower uh, one third. F flexing function was disrupted. Was disrupted in the shoulder and the elbow joint, which is caused by the damage to. So first of all, again, who can tell me whose <laughs> arm is this one? Who's, who, whose arm is this one again? Who can tell me? Me, I don't want to talk. Martinez. Ah, okay. Oh, me, I didn't say anything, no. It's yours. Tolu. Okay. Oh, Tolu. Hey. So you do your... <laughs> okay. Oh. Anyways, for the guys who are going to the gym. Okay. What muzzle is this thing called? For the guys. Or oh, anyone who can tell me. What muzzle? Tricep. Tricep. Yeah, tricep. And what muzzle is this one? The bicep, exactly. So those guys who want to have, who wants to wear some nine shirts. Me, I've been wearing some nine shirts, but nothing is showing. So me there, I've stopped wearing myself. So uh, you are laughing. Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing at me? Is it your muscles? Please leave me alone. I won't, go, I won't come and kill myself. Why? So those of you who have been gymming, the Yima Dems, the Benji Dems, those who have been gymming, you gym to build what? your triceps and your, and your what? Your, your bicep and your triceps. So, so you can wear nine shirts and you'll be taking our girls from us. We're going to go shame us. We will have money. We'll bring back our girls. Good. So now look at the question. The question says what? There is an incised wound on the anterior surface. So which part, which part are they talking about? Of course, the biceps. True or false? Sure. Exactly. Sure. So this is the anterior part. So talking about the anterior surface. So the lower one third, that means over here. Somewhere over here. That means you are dividing this into three. One, two, three. So this area, that's where the incised wound is. And this, of course, can affect the things over here for you not to be able to, to for us to have pains in the elbow joint area. Isn't it? Uh-huh. So over here, they are talking about what? They are talking about what? The bicep muscles of the arm. The bicep muscles of the arm. Now you can see the arm. They didn't say forearm. You see arm. That's why it's good to always learn. All right. Autopsy of an eight-month-old boy who died of severe an anemia. Sorry, severe pneumonia complicated with sepsis. Revealed absence of the thymus. Who can tell me what cells are found in the thymus? I just talked about it. Oh. The lymphocytes. Cells. Yes, the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. Okay. Yes, the lymphocytes. And lymphocytes are for what? Immunity, isn't it? They protect your body. So now there are absence of thymus. That means that this guy cannot have the group of these uh, cells. Now the lymph nodes. Now you see, another thing, lymph nodes have no lymphoid follicles and cortical surfaces. And again, lymph nodes, you can see the what? The lymphocyte there. 
You can remember, we just discussed it like a few minutes ago. Now, in this plane, the follicles are decreased inside and have no light centers. What, what is the cause of such changes? What is the cause of such changes? So what can you tell me? Of course, you are dealing with what? With a thymus a genesis. A thymus a genesis. What it means is that absence of thymus is not there. That means it's not growing. And of course, uh, as you are born, your thymus must correlate with, what, with your age. Your thymus must correlate with your age. And even in your need, you should have about 13.3 grams <laughs> on the average. 13.3 grams. That is the weight of the thymus should be 13.3. So you can imagine. Why? Because they are always doing things. Children will pick something, put it in their mouth. The way for Sina was always picking things. Rama 2 was always picking things on the floor. Everything they go touch. Everything they go touch. Even fire, they'll be going near it. <laughs> so one way by which God, you know, in his infinite wisdom, do it that it, he put all these lymphocytes there to help us fight against what? Diseases. That's why children, even though they, they can't talk, but you see, they still grow out fine because something is working in their, in their system. But as you grow, the lymphocyte decreases. Please take note. As you are growing, the time was shrinks. It begins to shrink. And that is why when you are growing, you are, you are prone to a lot of diseases. Uh-huh. Some of you are shaking, are shaking your head, are nodding your head. Yes. As you are growing, you are prone to what diseases. Why? Because the T cells, they, they reduce. And that's you must always take, your, uh, take care of yourself when you are young and then vibrant like me and, you know, like the way I'm vibrant, moving up and down, you know, no dull moment in my life. That's my own. Aha. So everything, they work gradually. Good. So when you're looking at what at C as our answer, thymus agenesis. A 40-year-old patient suffers from bronchial asthma, prolonged tachycardia. Choose the optimal drug for rapid relief. Guys, rapid relief. Rapid relief. What, are the, what is the first thing you give to somebody with asthma? Who can tell me? We've done this already. Sabutamol. Of course. Sabutamol. Yeah, so you nebulize the person with sabotamol sharply. A patient with urolithiasis, that is stones, has developed severe pain attacks. For pain, for pain shock prevention, he was administered an antispasmodic narcotic. Antispasmodic narcotic analgesic. What name? Who can tell me this one? We've done it. What's your answer? Promito. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some question I don't even Promito, remember. Promito, yeah. Yeah. Some question I don't remember myself again. No. I don't remember myself again. You guys, you are too good. If my quality level is now good. A patient suffers from acute pulmonary failure with pulmonary edema. With pulmonary what? Edema. One of you asked a question about this kind of questions. I mean, this kind of things. Now, what diuretic drug should be prescribed in the given case? Look, there is what? Acute pulmonary failure with edema. There is no sign of drug that has already been given. So right now, what are we going to do to save this person? Who can tell me? Give something that would excrete like the liquid or excess Thank water you. from the body. Thank you. So false diuretic. And the false diuretic here is called what? The furosemide. Furosemide. That one Quickly, it will reduce them. Quickly, it will reduce them. It will reduce them sub sharply. But don't give it too much. And you have to monitor. Otherwise, the person will enter into what? Who can tell me? What electrolyte will be affected with furosemide? Who can tell me? La, 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 la. Potassium, potassium. Potassium. Thank you. So then take care. People can have what? Arrhythmia. So please. Even though you are giving for diuretic, you must monitor the person for any sign of uh, 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 potassium imbalances. So over here, your answer is what? It's E. And that's why to, to, to monitor it, what do you give? What, what, what will you give to add it? If you are having a, a problem with the potassium, what will you give to add? Who can tell me? Oh. Potassium and... Uh -huh. 
sparring. <laughs> Potassium sparring. Sparring. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the fact that you have the idea and you know what you're talking about. Now, if it has been the option, you know the answer already. Another name for it is called what? Spiro. No lactone. That was a potassium. Sp- this guy, he doesn't care. He will reduce all the potassium in your system. He will take it out. But this guy will preserve it. Uh-huh. But it cannot take as much of uh, the water, uh, the fluid out as it will do with what first mind. That's why if you give first mind, you might want to, that if you're having some arrhythmia problem, you might want to give what this one like, like tone so that it can also come and help to balance the electrolyte. 